Should I go ahead and start a minute early? All right. So welcome back to Verified Functional Algorithms. And today I'm going to talk about search trees. Um, but before I talk about search trees, I want to explain a little feature called sections uh, in Calk. Um, so our search trees are meant to implement some sort of abstract data type with an operation to create an empty, well, search trees are meant to implement finite maps from some ordered key type to some arbitrary value type. And what are the operations of importance on finite maps? Well, there's to create the empty finite map that has an empty domain, and then um, insert um, uh, a key value binding in a finite map and look up a key in a finite map. So um, here is a simple implementation of finite maps, um, roughly as shown in the, um, the maps part of software foundations. It's not efficient at all. It, it represents maps with lists. And I have, um, let's see here, I have my map. Uh, is the type. Um, so this is the type of map from nat to v for some value type v. And it's just implemented as a list of nat cross v. I have the empty map um, of type v. And then I have a lookup function. My lookup function is parameterized not only by v, which is the type of the range, but a default value so that if the key x is not in the list of pairs, then it can return that default value uh, as its result. And then here's a theorem, lookup empty, that says, well, given the value type v and a, a default value of that type, um, if you look up x in the empty map, you get the default value. And so that lookup function has to be parameterized by the default value and lookup empty as a lemma has to be parameterized by the default value and so on. So that's um, a module that packages up uh, a tiny little abstract data type. It doesn't even have an insert function, so it's not very powerful, but it's going to illustrate my point about sections. OK, so um, it's tedious to have to keep parameterizing everything by v and many of the things by default. So Using the section feature of Coq, so I'm going to make this section called maps. And at the beginning of the section, I'll mention some variables, v, which is a type, and default, which is a v. And now within the section, um, any of these functions may refer to uh, default and v, but I don't have to explicitly mention the parameterization. So, Empty is just a my map, and its value is nil. Uh, lookup gets to make use of um, v here and uh, default here because they're scoped at the beginning of the section. OK, so I can do all of that. And this end maps ends the section. And if at this point I check the type of the lookup function, hold on. Lookup, uh, I want to be inside the module. All right, so it says lookup has type for all v, v arrow nat arrow my map v arrow v. So the first parameter is v. The second parameter is a thing of type v. That's default. So what the closing the section has done by this line end maps is to say, OK, these things v and default that were implicit parameters of lookup now become explicit parameters. 
Now, whenever you use lookup outside the section, you supply these explicit parameters just as if lookup had been defined uh, with a couple of explicit parameters uh, at the beginning. So that's a feature I'll use in this search tree example because it's convenient. Uh, you've seen it used a couple of times in other people's uh, cock developments without so much explanation. There's your explanation. Okay, so now let's move on to binary search trees. So um, I'm going to make a section trees with a V type and a default value because my lookup tables, my finite maps based on binary search trees will also have this property that if you look something up that's not there, the lookup function will want to return some sort of default value. And they also have this uh, polymorphism over the range type V. And the key type here will be just NAT. Of course, you could make binary search trees parameterized over any totally ordered type, and Cock allows you to do that quite easily. But in this simple pedagogical example, well, I want to keep it simple. And a tree is an inductive type with two constructors. The constructor E is a tree, so that's the leaf. It has no keys, no values, no anything. And the T constructor has a left subtree, a key, a value, a right subtree, and with those four parameters, uh, T is a tree. Okay, and now we can implement the three operations of this abstract data type, empty, lookup, and insert. So we implement empty tree, which is a tree, by a leaf. That's easy. We implement lookup as a recursive function that is structurally recursive on T. So um, to look up T in the leaf, we just return the default value. To look up T in a node with a left subtree and a right subtree, then we test whether X is less than the key in this node. And if so, return look up X TL. And so you notice that TL is a substructure of the tree T, so that this is a structurally recursive fixed point, and Koch likes it just fine. OK, so it just uses the Boolean less than comparison on natural numbers. And insert is not so different. So to insert. Um, the key binding pair XV in the tree S, well, if S is empty, if it's a leaf, we would just return a node with children that are leaves and the binding XV. Otherwise, if S is a node with key V prime, no, key Y, we test whether X is less than Y. And if so, we recursively call insert right here on the left subtree, which is called A and then wrap around it uh, a tree T um, with this new left subtree, the old key value pair Y V prime and the existing right subtree. So um, what's the, if the key, if the tree is reasonably balanced and has approximately N, uh, non, uh, N nodes in it, what's the time cost of doing insert? Well, log n, because the height of a reasonably balanced binary tree is log to the base 2 of the number of nodes in the tree, uh, modulo constant factors. And then we could ask, what's the space cost of inserting one node in a binary tree if it's reasonably balanced? So what's the answer? And the answer is not so, so straightforward. If somebody is holding on to the old tree and not letting go of it, then it will create log n new nodes. Um, and each one of those log n new nodes is either this t for this tree construction, or this tree for that tree construction, or that tree for this tree construction. So log n, that's what you might expect. But if nobody's holding on to the old tree, then most of the, whenever you create a new node, uh, some old node is getting garbage collected because it's no longer accessible. And so uh, if the key x was not present in the tree before, you have 
created sort of uh, log n plus one new nodes, and log n nodes have become garbage, and so one net new node is created. The space cost is one. All right. So that's insert, and it's yes. What about the call stack? Is, I mean, the space, the space call is stack. Um, Right. While you're running insert, it might have a call step of depth log n, yes, so right? Uh, but then all those things return. So by space cost, what I mean is how much space is permanently added to your heap by having done this operation, okay. right? Because temporarily, we can probably afford a cost of, of log n while insert is running. OK. Um, in my version of binary search trees, I like to have a function that um, takes your finite map and returns a list of pairs, of key binding pairs, in sorted order of keys. And I call this elements. So, um, so here's a version of an elements function, which I call slow elements. Um, All right, so S is the tree. If S is a leaf, then slow elements of S is nil. If S is a tree with left subtree A and right subtree B, then we can calculate slow elements of A and then concatenate that with the singleton list uh, KV cons nil, and then concatenate that with slow elements of B. And now you see we've got the entire list of key value bindings in sorted order. OK? And how long does that take? What's the time complexity of this function? Hint, it's called slow elements. <laughs> All right? Well, it's quadratic, because doing a list append takes linear time in the length of the first list. And so the second list append here uh, is cheap, because there's only one element in the list kv. But the first list append uh, is more or less linear time, and then the whole thing is quadratic. It's very handy for an elements function to return the elements in sorted order, because if you want to tell whether two, um, oh, let's say whether one, uh, the domain of one binary search tree is a subset of the domain of another binary search tree, you can quickly, one hopes, convert them to sorted lists, and then do sort of walk through the sorted lists in in linear time. But that's not useful if the operation is quadratic. So, so let's do it fast. And so here's my faster elements function that um, in the parameter base accumulates the list of all of the things to the right of the current key that we've seen so far and tacks. Um, kv onto the front. So let's stare at this elements prime for a second to see how the inner recursive call, um, elements prime b base, let's assert that that takes linear time in the length of the list that it constructs. And then it takes constant time to prepend to cons kv onto the front. And then let's assert that this takes linear time in uh, the number of elements uh, in A. And so that we get a kind of recursion, a recurrence relation between uh, the asserted linear time cost of elements prime in the subcalls and the linear time cost in the result. And that's a proof that it takes linear time. OK. Uh, so it's nice and fast. And then, then elements itself is just. Uh, calling elements prime with the base of nil uh, right here. OK, so um, let's look at some examples. I'm going to make a section. Um, and bind some variables in that section, v4, v5, v2. 
uh, of the range type. And let's make this tree that's the insert, well, insert the binding 4 and V5 into the empty tree. And then into that tree, insert 2 and V2. Uh, and in that tree, insert the binding of uh, 5V5. And we do eval compute, and we get this tree. So at the root, we have the key 4. Um, to the left, in the left child of the root, we have the key 2. 2 is less than 4. That's good. All right? And in the right-hand child, we have the key 5. 5 is greater than 4. That's good. And then we can look up the key 5 in that tree. And uh, it computes, sorry, go back to here. It computes to V5. Um, sorry, it's not in. Yes, that's right. OK, so um, this tree behaves as you would expect. And then finally, if we compute elements on that tree, we get 2v2, 4v5, 5v5. And notice that 2, 4, and 5 are in sorted order. OK, so now, what shall we prove about search trees? And there are two ways to think about what we should prove about search trees. Um, and uh, first, I will show you one way to think about it. And then I will show you another way to think about it. The first way um, is that uh, operations on finite maps should have certain properties about how they relate to each other. And you saw this in the Software Foundation's maps module, right? That um, this lemma, T update eek, says that if you have any map M and you update it with the binding XV and then you look up X, you get back V. And we don't have an explicit lookup operator here. We just apply uh, this map T update M XV to the thing you're looking up because we are taking advantage of knowing that these finite maps happen to be implemented as functions uh, from keys to values. And here's another uh, property of finite maps, update neek. If you update a map M with binding X1 to V, and then you look up X2 that's not equal to X1, you get the same thing you would have gotten in the original map. So Finite maps have these sort of commutation properties on their operators, update eek, update neek, update shadow, which says if you uh, update with x map to v1 and then update again with x map to v2, it's as if you had just updated with x map to v2, right? Update same um, says that if you update m, at x with the value that you got by looking up x in m, it's as if you didn't do anything at all. You have the same m back again. And update permute and apply empty. That if you look up something in the empty map, you get the default value. All right, so um, uh, these form a kind of specification of, um, of finite maps. And if we want to prove that binary search trees implement finite maps, then we might be proving uh, similar theorems about binary search trees. But I'm going to do it first a different way, which is I'm going to prove that binary search trees implement the finite maps from uh, the Software Foundations library. That is, they there's an abstraction relation that relates some binary search tree to some finite map from the Software Foundation's maps library. And, and I'll prove properties of that abstraction relation. So um, let's do that. The type in question is total map. You all remember total map from playing with it in the imp programs? Yes? So before you were saying something about a specification, and now are you taking finite maps as you Well, OK. So one way to think about 
um, uh, the proof of search trees is to prove these commutation relations on search tree operations. The other way is to prove a relation between search trees and this total underscore map type, and then take advantage of the fact that the total underscore map type has those commutation properties. Problem. Oh. Okay, um, so we need some relation abs whose type is tree arrow total map v arrow prop. That is, it's a relation between trees and total maps. And we can choose any abstraction relation we want as long as we can prove the appropriate properties. Yes? So I, I like this, step, this, this specification, but another specification that people often use with binary search trees is the invariance over binary search trees. It's just that all the on the left are less than and all the on the right are right. Well, um, specifying it that way, right? well, we will get there. We will need that invariant, but that's just a property that the search trees happen to have. It doesn't show that they represent anything and that the way in which they represent them has the commutation properties we want. So yeah, it's a necessary sanity check on binary search trees and you need that property of the trees in order to prove the things we want to prove, but it's not really a correctness proof about binary search trees. And I will claim that um, if we define an abstraction relation, any one we want that will allow us to prove the following theorems about lookup and insert, that's a correctness proof. Okay, so I want to relate a tree to a total map in some way that makes sense. And there's actually choices about how to do this, but I claim for the empty tree, there's not much choice. The empty tree, the leaf, should relate to the empty finite map, or in particular, the total map that everywhere returns the default value. Okay, so um, the abs relation should have the property that the thing I just highlighted is a true proposition. Okay, now, um, what do I want to relate this example tree to? Let's see. Um, well, that's a homework problem. Okay, figure out what uh, total map and build this total map, by the way, using the operators from the total map, uh, from the maps chapter of Software Foundations, which is also right here in this directory. This should be easy. Okay, but now let's talk about how we want to uh, define the abstraction relation for the case where it's, it's a T tree instead of an E tree. And for this, um, I'm going to use this funny combine function. So let's look at the combine function. Now remember that the, um, the total map in the maps um, module is not a function from natural number to binding, but a function from identifier to binding, where identifier is precisely, um, what is ID? Better yet, 
It's this inductive type that has one constructor, ID, that has a natural number in it. So it's just a wrapper for natural numbers. Yes? So, so that's true, but then you don't remember it. Uh, because in the software foundations materials, uh, identifiers, ID is a wrapper for strings. All right. <laughs> well, here it's a wrapper for natural numbers. It, in software foundations, it used to be a wrapper for natural numbers. And I guess I haven't caught up with software foundations. OK. So, but that's easy. We can just use a match right here to extract x prime, which is a natural number under, underneath there. And now, here's what combine does. It takes two total maps, m1 and m2, and splices them together at a pivot value. And so when you look up x in your combined map, we ask, is x less than the pivot value? If so, look up x in m1. And is x greater than or equal to the pivot value? If so, look up x in m2. Is this the right definition of how to splice the maps together? Should you worry? The answer is yes and no. Okay? Sometimes I tell you you should worry about something. I ask, was this the right specification of some function? Because you know, if you prove a thing to the wrong specification, uh, then your proof is useless. But here, I claim, if this is the wrong uh, combine, then my important proofs won't go through later. right? So any combine that I can exhibit that will get the rest of my proofs to go through is legitimate. And so you should suspend your disbelief until you see what theorems I can prove using this combine. That is to say, any abstraction relation I can demonstrate that allows my theorems to go through about um, look up and update uh, is fine. OK, so uh, here's my abstraction relation. It relates a tree to a total map. It has two constructors, abs E and abs T. Abs E relates the leaf to the always default total map. And abs t, well, it relates this t node. The t node has a left subtree, a key, a value, a right subtree. And it relates it to, well, first, combine a and b around the pivot k. So splice together uh, a to be used if the key is less than k, and b to be used if the key is greater than or equal to k. That's a total map, because that's the type of combine. And now update that total map with one more binding that binds k to v. So that's my abstraction relation. Yes? The interesting thing about this example is that you could also write an abstraction function that computes and also wouldn't need to use a less than test. But the, the proof probably aren't quite as nice if you do it that way. There's many ways to do it. All right. Um, yes? Why don't you do it in two steps rather than making the combined function uh, do the update? You know, then combine needs another if statement. So whether your extra if statement is in combine or in the t update in this line, what does it matter? OK. Um, also, here's another reason. I fiddled with it until I got the proofs to go through, and then I stopped. That's not quite true, but you could think of it that way. Um, this abstraction relation is, in the end, going to be hidden away from the eventual consumer of the properties of your, of your uh, implementation. So uh, it doesn't have to be completely beautiful. All right, let's um, check this theorem. So what's the theorem say? that this example tree with v2, v4, v5 uh, abstracts to uh, the example map on v2, v4, v5. Now, if I unfold example tree, right? Let's, let's look at the proof over here, the proof goal. So the example tree somehow relates to the example map. Um, and if I 
print the example map. Why did that not do anything? You purposely decided not to define it, right? Is it just an exercise? Ah, I didn't define it. All right. So let's do this. Promise not to remember this too much when you define your example map. But I'm going to, here's a cock uh, trick. I'm going to make an existential variable m of type total map v. So look above the line. m stands for some unknown total map. I have to fill it in before the end of the proof. Okay? And I'm going to replace example map v2, v4, v5 with m. Okay, so notice my second proof goal is to prove that m equals example map v2, v4, v5, which may be difficult since we haven't defined the body of example map, but that's the second proof goal, and here we are in the first proof goal. So I have to prove that the abs of that tree is some map. Let's look at the first proof goal. Let's unfold m. So now we've got an existential variable for m. So I can fill in any map I like. Uh, to be the abstraction of this tree. And, well, it's abs. I have an inductive data type below the line, right? and I have to prove that it relates something. And so the inductive data type has constructors. So let's apply some constructor. I'm guessing that the T constructor is the one that's going to be applied here, because that's, I've got a T right after the word abs in the proof goal. All right, so constructor. That leaves two proof goals. Let's prove the first one by constructor. That leaves another two proof goals. So now I've got abs E, question mark A. Let's instantiate A by applying a constructor. And let's instantiate B0 by implying a constructor. And then um, I've got to do this one. So that's some more constructors. Who's ever written a prologue program? OK, I just ran a prologue program. OK, by use of unification variables and LTAC, you run prologue programs. I think maybe even Benjamin demonstrated such a thing. But maybe, yeah, yeah, in proofs about imp or something or other. Right, OK. Um, now, let's move on. Here are the three theorems all on the same page, that are the heart of the correctness proof of binary search trees. Let me uh, widen this window. You have to prove that the empty tree relates to the empty map. T empty of default is the everywhere default map, right? And lookup relate says, um, if I have a tree T and um, a map CTS, which you can think of, I think of it as contents, but I really should have called it M here. Let's call it M. Okay, so what does this say? If T relates to M and we look up k in t, we get the same thing we get if we looked up k in m. All right? So that proves that my binary search tree is a proper refinement of that uh, abstract uh, sort of reference implementation. And finally, we need to prove insert relate, which is if uh, t relates to m and then we insert uh, the KV binding in T, and we insert the KV binding in M, then those two things relate to each other. OK? So when you prove the correctness of one implementation uh, with respect to sort of an abstract uh, reference implementation, your job is to provide any abstraction relation you want that can satisfy these three properties. 
and filling in the proofs of look up relate and insert relate are basically the proof of correctness of binary search trees and that's the homework. So questions about that. And you do it by induction. All right. Well, OK, but I left something out. I had this elements function that I also want uh, to be part of the uh, operations on binary search tree. And remember what elements does. It takes my binary search tree and gives me a list of its bindings in sorted order. So. Um, and we can formalize how that fits with the abstraction relation. My list to map is sort of the elements function for total maps. That is, list to map um, takes a list of key binding pairs and gives me a total map by inserting, by updating uh, one after another into the total map. So is everybody happy with this fixed point function that takes a list of key binding pairs and inserts them one after another into the Software Foundation style total map? OK. And, um, and now here's my uh, claim about the appropriate thing to prove for elements, which is to say, if um, if the abstraction relation relates T to M, then the elements of T, if you insert them all into the empty map, you get M. Why didn't I do it the other way? Why didn't I write a function from M to its list of elements? Right? This list to map, why didn't I write map to list? that takes a total underscore map and returns its list of key binding pairs. Yeah, those, those maps are opaque. They're cock functions. And you can't ask a cock function uh, on which parts of your domain are you not equal to some default value. Some guy, some PhD student at Princeton proved that. Uh, Turing, that was his name. Yes. Uh, he proved it before he came to Princeton for his graduate degree, but what the hell. All right. So it wasn't actually possible to write the specification that other way. But we can write the specification in this direction, list to map. And so I claim that this is the property you'd want to prove about um, elements. OK? Yes. Uh, if you built your total underscore map only by doing t update, but uh, the cock type total map, let's see what it really is. It's type arrow type. Okay, so I can. I think you meant print instead of check. Yeah, that's probably what I meant. Um, it's identifier arrow A. So really, any function can masquerade as a total map. And I can write cock functions, like the identity function, that returns a different value for every identity, for every identifier. Yeah. So I just don't see a good alternative to this way of characterizing elements. OK. Remember I said there are things you should worry about and things you should not worry about? Well, you should worry about whether I've correctly characterized elements. Yes? Well, even if the elements was a permutation, that property would still be true, right? You'd come up with the same total function. Um, yes. What, the question is, uh, this abstraction relation isn't quite good enough because it doesn't guarantee that elements returns its list in sorted order. It just makes sure that the list has the right set of things in it. Yep. So 
Specifications are harder to get right than proofs in Coq. Coq can tell you when your proofs are wrong. It can't always tell you when your specifications are wrong. But close enough. Uh, this is the theorem we want to prove. Elements relate. Um, well, you saw my elements function. It had this, um, I had the slow elements, and I had the uh, uh, fast elements. And suppose I guarantee to you that the slow elements and the fast elements are equivalent functions. Right, so there's no trickiness in slow elements. Um, is this theorem true? Because you know this theorem terminates with abort, so Koch doesn't guarantee to you that it's true. So think about it. Do you believe it? And um, so instead, I ask you to prove this theorem called not elements relate, which says uh, it is not the case that for all t and m, abs t m implies list to map. And why is that? Well, the t we're going to use is this bogus tree. What's bogus about it? Well, it's got a root with a key of two and a left child with a key of three. That's structurally perfectly good, but it doesn't have that search tree property. And um, well, it turns out that uh, you can, um, that, that elements doesn't actually produce the right thing. Uh, what happens if you look up three in this tree? Well, three is greater than two, so it'll look it up in the right-hand side. So look up will return the default value, not v. This bogus tree behaves very strangely, and look up um, behaves strangely, and you know all bets are off. So. What we need is a representation invariant. Okay? Um, and the representation invariant says all the nodes in the left subtree have keys that are less than the node at the root. And all the nodes in the right subtree have keys that are greater than the node at the root. And so here's what the representation invariant might look like. We make this function for all nodes that looks at all the nodes in the left subtree and make sure that they are, that they satisfy property P. And um, so now we can define search tree X, which is my, is a search tree property by saying at every node in T, this holds, well, for every node in the left subtree of T, the key J is less than the key K. And for every node in the right subtree, um, the key j is greater than the key k. And then we can prove that our example tree created by the insert function is actually a good tree. It satisfies search tree x. So let's do that. So there's the thing we want to prove. And if we uh, unfold a little bit with the HNF tactic, which for, for head normal form, and we simplify. This is what we have to prove. What are all those ands? Well, if you look at for all nodes there at the top of the screen, it's a fixed point that unfolds to a big, big conjunction. So there's our big, big conjunction. And we have to prove 2 is less than 4, and true, and true, and 5 is greater than 4, and true, and true, and true, and true, and true, and true. So repeat, split, auto. OK. So, um, so now we can prove this theorem. This is the kind of theorem we want to prove, that if the tree is, has the search tree property, if the tree, you know, at every node, the left subtree has keys less than the root, and the right subtree has keys greater than the root at, at every node, and there's an abstraction relation between t and m, then list to map of elements t equals m. All right, this is the kind of theorem we want to prove. 
But this is not the theorem we want to prove. And why is that? Because that characterization of the search tree property is really clumsy. It has like two levels of for all quantifiers in it. It's awful. What we want to prove is that at every node, the left subtree's root is less, has a key less than the current node. And for the keys underneath that, you know, let's let them take care of themselves. That's not quite what we want to prove. Here is an inductive relation that characterizes search trees more economically and in a way that will be easier to prove things about. Okay? Um, a search tree, this tree, um, how do I want to say this? We're going to characterize this tree to say all its keys are bounded between this low value and this high value. Okay? That's what we mean. And by the way, the low value is less than the high value. So when the tree is empty, so E, this is a leaf, uh, well, all the keys in E are less than, you know, are in between low and high, but will require also that low is less than or equal to high. It will make no sense to say search tree, you know, low, high, where low is not actually less than or equal to high. And for a node with left tree L and right tree R, well, we'll say, first of all, that uh, L is bounded between low and K. And R is bounded between successor of K and high. Okay. And by the way, I claim inductively that low is less than or equal to K, and successor of K is less than or equal to high, and so on. So, is that the right property, right? And then search tree without a prime is just to bound, uh, to say that for all high, so let me fix this up. That T is a search tree if there exists a high value such that, and there exists a low value such that T is in between the high value and the low value. But for the low value, we might as well use zero. These are natural numbers, not integers. Okay, you might ask, is that the right characterization? Is that even equivalent to the other characterization? And no, I might ask you to prove that for the homework, that these two characterizations of uh, is a search tree are equivalent. That will give you some confidence in this one. The other one basically spoke for itself. Okay. Why should you bother having confidence in this one? Because this one's easier to use in proving the important properties about you know, preservation of this property under the insert operation. So here we go. Um, here's a theorem that if um, we have any arbitrary t, not just the empty one, and it's bounded in between low and high with search tree prime, then indeed low is less than or equal to high. And it's proved by induction one omega. And if you want to see the details, you can step through it yourself. Okay. Now, why were we doing this search tree property? Well, it was because we couldn't prove the abstraction of elements, right, without it. Miraculously, we could, prog we could program, uh, we could prove things about insert and lookup without it. It's, it's a miracle. That miracle has to do with the clever notion of my combined function. But we couldn't do elements. So we're, we're gearing up to prove that elements is correct. Right? That was the purpose of defining this search tree property. But elements is a rather complicated function. Remember it had you know, this extra elements prime and then it called itself with a base value on the right. And I showed you slow elements before. Um, right here. That's much more intuitive and simple. Its recursion is easier, it has fewer parameters. We'd rather prove that this one is correct. And actually, I claim it's simpler to first prove that this one is equivalent to the other one, and then prove that this one has the right properties, than to directly prove that that complicated one has the right properties. So, 
Uh, that's what we'll do. Theorem. Elements equals so slow elements. Well, equals. They're both functions, and they have different... Um, they have different implementations. So how can they be equal? In the base Koch logic, they're not equal. They're not unequal, but they're not equal. Um, if you were Leibniz, you would say, well, these behave the same in any context. You can't tell them apart, so they're equal. All right? That's Leibniz's axiom of extensional equality. And uh, I have imported e functional extensionality into this development. It's an axiom that you can add to Koch that is consistent with base Koch and does no harm. All right? And to use it, we'll say, instead of proving directly that elements equal slow elements, we will say, for all s, elements of s equal slow elements of s. And now, uh, if we unfold elements, now we have elements prime s nil equals slow elements of s. If we try and prove that directly by induction on s, we will run into trouble. We need to prove a more general theorem, which is that for all bases, elements prime s base equals slow elements s concatenated with base. All right, that you can prove. I invite you to do so, and then you can finish the rest of the theorem. And that theorem uh, will demonstrate that, well, that theorem allows us now to prove uh, the appropriate search tree properties, you know, the appropriate abstraction property of elements, and, uh, and that's in the homework, and it's complicated. That's sort of strange that it's so complicated, right? You do all this stuff, and you're still not done. Right? Because there's that telltale fill in here uh, for you to do. So that's sort of strange. Uh, the proofs of look up and insert were pretty easy. I didn't show them to you because they're the homework. The proof of elements was more complicated. Um, let's see. Um, Ah, let me talk about this. Suppose I, I build a search tree. So now I've got my search tree. I built it by calling insert a bunch of times. And now I want to apply elements to it and get my nice list of elements. Well, the theorem about elements says that works if that search tree I built has this search tree property. You know, all the keys down here are greater and all the keys down here are less. How do I know that the search tree I got by calling insert all those times has the search tree property? Right? If I'm going to be using insert and elements, then that better be true. So here's a useful theorem. Insert search tree. It says, if t has the search tree property, then insert kvt has the search tree property. So that and the fact that the empty tree has the search tree property is enough to guarantee that any tree you make by the use of insert uh, has the search tree property, and you can apply elements to it and get the result you want. OK. So um, What do I want to say here? Here's the kind of theorem you would normally need to prove about something like lookup or insert. It is. If a tree T is, satisfies the representation invariant, right, has the search tree property, and it relates to some total map, then when you look up T, a K in the tree, you'll get the right answer. Now, what theorem did we prove, look up relate? 
It was just like this, except it left out this line. Now, obviously, the thing we proved was stronger, right? If it didn't need one of its premises, then uh, from the old lookup relate, you can prove the new lookup relate by saying, OK, throw away this fact h, clear h, bingo, and apply h0. So that was easy. But why was it that we were able to prove um, this property without even needing the search, this, this relation, without even needing the representation invariant? Well, sometimes you get lucky. But you can't count on getting lucky. That is, um, the theorem I should have stated at the beginning is that, you know, is the, the weaker theorem, this one right here, right? That when you have a data structure, right, it only some syntactic values of the underlying type qualify as valid members of your abstract data type. And you can't just take any garbage that comes along. You really only want the kind of garbage that your operators built. Okay? So you state some property, some abstract property, in this case, search tree, that you think all the ones uh, that your operators will produce. And uh, that's going to be a requirement for anything, any properties you might prove about how your operators work. Okay? Um, yeah. What's the philosophy behind not putting the invariant like search tree inside the abstraction relation? Good question. Um, the quick answer is uh, that's dependent type hackery, and right. Uh, and you know, I wanted to keep things simple. And in general, when I'm doing first order programming. If I can try and if I can avoid mixing propositions with my programs, then my programs are sort of simpler to manipulate and understand. That's an interesting uh, other direction to talk about, but it's not what I was asking about. Okay. So why would you define the abs as the? Oh, I see. I could have made the abs property stronger by only relating things that are valid search trees, and that would be fine. If you want to think about your abstraction relation as including your representation invariant. You could structure things that way in how you prove things about abstract data types. OK, so um, yes. So the reason I didn't happen to need the search tree property uh, in the proof of insert and lookup is because combine was chosen so cleverly that it got strange answers on the bogus tree. Um, and that's sort of explained in the lecture notes. So as you're doing the homework, if you choose to read about that stuff, you can read about it. Um, what I want to do now is take the two or three minute break, uh, as requested uh, sometime in the feedback last week. And then I'll move to um, just a little bit more about how to think about abstract data types and search trees in Coq. So I'll see you in three minutes. I can never remember how to increase the font size in Emacs. Does anybody remember? Control Shift Plus. I knew it was some combination. No? Control X and then plus. Control X and then plus. Possibly Control Plus. Yeah, yeah, there we go.
Yes. But I need to do it. Control X plus Control. Ah. Control Shift plus. I give up. Emacs anyway. I know I need Emacs. All right. Um, All right, uh, before we talk more about abstract data types, let's talk about extracting programs from Coq and running them in OCaml. Because what's the point of verifying your efficient functional program if you can't run it fast? And you certainly can't run it fast inside Coq. Or sort of you can, but you couldn't actually connect it to any you know, input-output to the outside world. So, Coq has an extraction facility that will sort of pretty print a Galena function as an OCaml program or a Haskell program or whatever. And then you can compile it with your favorite optimizing compiler for uh, OCaml or Haskell. So let's see what the abstraction, the extraction mechanism looks like. There's this keyword, extraction sort, if you remember your insertion sort. And so sort is this fixed point here and it translates to OCaml as this let rec here which is not really so surprising it looks pretty much the same um, except that this sort function relied on this other uh, function insert so typically what you really want is recursive extraction which says um, Give me everything. So it says, OK, that relied on an inductive data type in, o in Coq called bool. So we'll, def we'll translate that to OCaml as type bool is the data type with constructors true and false. And type nat has O and S of nat. And type alpha list is nil or cons of alpha cross alpha list. And here's the module nat. All right, here's the insert function. Let rec insert of i equals function, and now you can see the correspondence of this insert to that insert, and so on. So it's just a translation into OCaml. Um, 
Well, then you can get fancy and you can say, well, OCaml has a bool type and I'd like to be compatible with other functions that might call me that use that same bool type. So when you extract the cock type bool, uh, extract it as the OCaml type bool that happens to have these constructors. And same for the OCaml type list. And now do your recursive extraction. And now you notice that it doesn't do bool and so on. OK. We'll get an OCaml program that sorts, or let's say we're doing search trees. We'll get an OCaml program that does search trees with natural numbers defined with O and S. So if you've got uh, 987 in your search tree, then it will be represented by 987 S's followed by an O. And each S is a record in the heap pointing to another record. And that's no fun. So uh, unless you're, so we could use the Z type. And that would take us down to a log n number of pointers in the heap per integer. And that might be good enough. Often it is good enough. And you should stop fooling around right there. But let's fool around a little. <laughs> OK. So what I want, I'm going to make up a new type in Coq, parameter int colon type. Well, axiomatizing the idea that there exists a type called int, that's not yet a logical inconsistency. So I'm safe with this axiom. In general, you're not safe with axioms. That's why Coq ID colors it this ugly orange yellow color. Uh, uh, parameter int type. It's like an admit, right? All right. And I'm going to tell the extraction, the extractor to extract this int type from cock into the int type of OCaml. So that's fine. Now, um, I'm going to posit that there exists a function LTB, less than Boolean, uh, that takes two integers and returns a bool. That seems like a safe enough axiom that there might exist such a function. And I'll extract that as the OCaml less than on the int type. OK, now we need some more axioms about LTB. And here's where we could run into trouble. What do we think is true about the, the OCaml int type? Well, it's basically it's a 31-bit signed integer type or a 63-bit signed integer type. So it has, it's totally ordered with less than. And you know it has a plus function and a minus function. And how does plus relate to less than? Well, let's, that, that's actually very tricky, because you do enough pluses in OCaml and it wraps around. So the relation of plus to less than is, I could easily state something that's not true. And once you state something that's not true as an axiom, all your theorems get really easy to prove. OK? <laughs> let's not do that. But in order to characterize binary search trees, I don't need plus. The operator that's used in binary search trees is less than. So I'm going to axiomatize that there's some injection from this fixed precision signed 32-bit integer, 31-bit integer, to the true mathematical integers. That's an axiom that that injection exists. Um, it seems safe enough. And that there's a less than relation that has um, this property that if LTB nm equals true, then the injection in the integers, the, the int to z of n, is actually less than the int to z of m. Well, is this true about the actual OCaml less than and the actual OCaml 31-bit integer? Yes, it is. Therefore, it's consistent to add it to the logic. But you should be a little suspicious, all right? And you should stop me there before I add any more axioms. OK, I'm not going to add any more axioms. That's enough, almost. Yeah, that is enough to prove you know, what we need uh, about our uh, OCaml program for um, binary search trees. So now, here's our binary search tree program, um, except we'll do them on, these int, on this int type instead of on NAT. OK, so it's a new program, a lot like the old program. And it uses LTB here instead of uh, the natural version of LTB. Otherwise, the same program. You could prove all the same things about it. So here, here's how to prove lookup relate. You copy paste your proof from the other file, and you change the nats to ints. OK. Um, and now let's do recursive extraction. 
and we'll recursive extraction, and we want these things. We want the empty tree, we want insert, we want lookup, we want elements. So let's do that. And it shows us in the right-hand window all the things we'd get. Um, and, and indeed, there's our lookup function in OCaml, and it sort of looks like what you'd expect. All right. You really want to extract things into an ML file so that the ML compiler can compile them. Right? We don't want to have to hook up the ML compiler to the COC interactive development environment. So extraction right here in this next line uh, allows you to provide a file name to extract into. So now we've got search tree ML, which is OCaml code corresponding to the insert function, the lookup function, the tree data type with its E and T constructors, and so on. OK, what's next? Let's write an OCaml function to benchmark this program. If we're going to write efficient functional programs, then we should measure them. So what does this do? Test, you know, basically, um, when I run tests, I'm going to test inserting a million random integers, all between 0 and a million, into the church tree. And then uh, looking up a million random integers. I think that's what test random does, something like that. And then I'll do 20,000 random integers. Then I'll do 20,000 consecutive integers inserted into the search tree and looked up. Um, OK, so um, Sorry if the print is too small. I couldn't figure out how to get my Emacs to, well, I can make it, I think. What are they doing? Control X, Control Plus. You can use Windows Plus. Windows Plus. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, but, OK. How do I undo that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's run it, OK? So it's running. It's the million integers. And it took 1.344 seconds to insert and look up a million random integers. That's not bad. And 20,000 random integers only took 0 0.016 seconds. But the 20,000 consecutive integers, <laughs> still thinking, up. Oh, it took 5.281 seconds. Why? Who knows why? When you insert consecutive integers into a binary search tree, let's start with 1, so that's at the root, and then 2, that's to the right, and then 3, that's bigger than 1, and it's bigger than 2, so it goes here, then 4 goes here, then 5. It's the maximally unbalanced tree. Now, on the average, your tree will be balanced. And the idea that you could be presented with an input file that happens to be in order is practically inconceivable. No, it happens all the time. So, you know, using plain old search trees, um, you could run into difficulties. This is why you want balanced binary search trees, which I will talk about tomorrow. But today, uh, if I can... There we go. If I can finish up this lecture, I will talk about abstract data types. So here's how you would define an abstract data type in Coq or in OCaml or in any language with a decent module system. We would say um, maybe we have some module type table. So this is an interface. It's an interface to a module. And there will be a range type, a default value of the range type, a table type. It's an abstract data type. I won't tell you how table is implemented. I might define that key in this particular module, any, any, rep any uh, implementation of this module, the keys will be natural numbers. So this is a transparent definition in the interface. Um, there's an operator called empty, which returns a table an operator called get, which get, you give it a key and a table, and it returns a V, an operator called set, 
All right? So this would be all, you know, you could do this in OCaml. Who's done this kind of thing in OCaml or some similar language? Or standard ML, for that matter, where it was invented. OK, uh, what you can't do in OCaml is these axioms. So we have these axioms about um, the thing that get k empty is the default value. And GSS stands for get set same. If I take a, tr uh, a table T and I insert the key binding pair kv and then I look up k, then I get v back. And get set other says if I look up j not equal to k, then I get back whatever I would have gotten in the original t. So these are the axioms. Axioms are usually dangerous, but they're not dangerous in module types. Here they're just specifications of theorems that any instance of this module must provide. And the proof that they're not dangerous is that when I load this into cock IDE, it colors it green and not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we want to implement the module. So uh, here we say, let's implement the module by means of total map. Total map, I claim, can implement this abstract interface. And here's how. So the first line says, uh, maps table is an implementation of table. Um, when I close the module here at the end, end maps table, it's going to check that every required thing in that interface is provided and has the right type. OK? So I have to provide v, which has to be uh, something. I'm going to provide type just to make things confusing. So this will be a mapping from natural numbers to types. <sighs> Why not? OK. Uh, what type should I use as the default? I'll use the type prop, just to make things even more confusing, just for fun. OK, and now I have to get serious. The table will be total map of v. So that's my representation type, my hidden representation type for this ADT, abstract data type. And key is nat, that's required. Um, and then the empty table will be implemented by t underscore empty applied to default. and then get km is going to be implemented by just applying that function m to id k. Uh, that's very straightforward. Set is really just implemented by t underscore update. Um, and look here. The GSS theorem that says get k of set k v t equals v is implemented by applying t update eek that was already proved for total map. I mean, these are the properties we already proved. Here, this maps table is just packaging them into what we would consider an abstract data type. And similarly, GSO is proved by applying T update neek. So at end maps table, we get um, an implementation of total map. So let's see. If I do eval compute in. Um, set one bool in maps table dot empty and then set three unit and then get one, I get back bool. So I can run um, from outside the abstract data type, I can run it even if I, you know, don't see what the type actually is. Okay, now I claim search trees can implement this uh, specification interface. So for search trees, I might also choose the range to be type, just for fun, and the default value to be prop. That doesn't really matter. Table will be tree of v. Key will be nat. The empty table will be the empty tree, which of course was the leaf, the e constructor. Um, get will be the lookup function. And remember, because of that section stuff, we're outside of that section that we were in in the other file. So now lookup has these extra parameters that were section variables v and default. So fine. Get is just lookup. Set is just insert. And um, g empty is easily proved. But gss. OK. Um, how do we prove gss? Uh, well, 
If we unfold get and set, here's what we have to prove. That if we look up um, k in insert v k v t, we get back v. Now, what did we already prove about binary search trees? We proved an abstraction relation. So what we want is, you know, whatever total map t relates to, let's do the lookup in that, because we know how that works. What total map does t relate to? Well, here I proved in the other file this lemma. Can relate. It says, for any t that's a tree, there exists a map that's a total map V, such that the abstraction relation holds between T and that map. Any tree, you know, there's some map that satisfies the abstraction relation. Why is this theorem called unrealistically strong can relate instead of just can relate? Well, normally, your can relate theorem would say this, for any well-constructed tree, any tree that satisfies the search tree property, right, then there exists a map that relates. This one uh, works regardless. And that's just a coincidence. It's a miracle. It, you shouldn't count on it in general, right? Normally, uh, you'll only be able to find something that relates to a tree that satisfies its representation invariant. OK, well. Um, but as long as we have this theorem and it's proved and it's true, let's use it. So we'll destruct that existential, the exists CTS that's right there. And so now we have CTS, which is a total map. We have H, which is a proof that T relates to CTS. And we have a theorem, insert relate. Remember that theorem? If we instantiate insert relate the right way, we get this fact H0, which says insert KVT relates to T update of CTS with whatever, OK? And we also have the theorem lookup relate. So let's instantiate lookup relate. And it says, if you look up K in insert KVT, that's the same as applying update CTS KV to K. All right, so because we have these theorems about the abstraction relation between binary search trees and this reference implementation, we've reduced the problem of proving get set same to the problem of proving it about the reference implementation. But it's easy in the representation, in the reference implementation, we have T update eek as a theorem. So what I had to do here to prove GSS, I didn't have to do any proofs by induction. I didn't have to do any proofs where I actually understood the abstraction relation or the data structure. I just used the previous abstraction relation that I had proved, insert relate and lookup relate, and this very useful theorem can relate, right? And that's a general technique. Once you've proved the appropriate abstraction theorems about you know, each of your operators, your insert relate, your lookup relate, your operator relate for each operator. And once you've proved the appropriate kind of can relate theorem, then um, making a module like this, uh, you know, reduces to um, proving those things for the reference implementation. So that's very good. And uh, it's not a difficult exercise at all for you to do this for the get set other theorem. You just do the same thing uh, as shown in the GSS theorem. OK, well, that was all very good. But that unrealistically strong can relate was unrealistically strong. And in real life, you will more often have a can relate theorem that looks like this. It says, for any tree t, if it satisfies the search tree property, then there exists a map CTS that relates to it. OK, so suppose that was 
all we had, we didn't have unrealistically strong can relate, we only have can relate, how can we prove the GSS theorem? Well, we can't really. Because in that version of uh, the module, let's go back to that version of the module, a table is just implemented by a tree data structure. And that's any clown could come along and provide some bogus tree that doesn't satisfy the representation invariant, and we'd re be required to make the GSS theorem apply to it, and it might not. So we want to restrict ourselves to um, tree data structures that satisfy the representation invariant. Yes? Um, not directly that way, but I'll show you the only way I know how to do it in Coq, which is we're going to use a dependent product of a tree with a proof about the tree. Okay, so let me tell you in the six minutes I have left uh, how to do that, just in case you're interested. So here's a type. It's written this way. Um, it's a pair. It's got a value x paired with a proof of p of x. p is some predicate. p has type a arrow prop. x has type a. So this allows you to bundle up a value with a proof of some property of that value. And exist is a constructor for this type. So uh, exist allows you to demonstrate x with the proof of p of x, and it bundles it up that way. And now you have a pair of things and you want to get out the pieces. So you could do it, I guess, by pattern matching, or you could do it proj1 sig. Um, so project one out of a sigma type gives you x back out of this pair, and proj2 sig gives you the proof of p of x back out of this pair. And now here's how we use that. The table type will now be the type of pairs of uh, some, value, some value x, which is a tree with a proof of search tree x. So it's every, every member of this table type is a tree bundled up with a proof that it satisfies the search tree property. And then the empty table is, well, the exist constructor applied to the empty tree and a proof that the empty tree is a search tree. And the get function, well, we have m, which is a table. It's one of these bundles. So let's project out the tree part of that bundle to get only you know, the tree, proj1 sig of m, that's the tree. Now we can uh, look up um, uh, in that tree. That was easy. But set is a little harder, right? We have our bundle m. We can project out the tree part. So proj1 sig of m is the tree. Then we can insert in the tree. So now we've got our new tree. To make the new bundle, we have to construct a proof that that new tree has the property we want. But we have a lemma that does that. Insert search tree constructs out of a proof that m is a search tree, a proof that insert into m is a search tree. So there we go. That's set. And then um, these theorems are easy. And finally, when we prove GSS right here on this line, we can use can relate. And when can relate demands as a premise that the thing is a search tree, we've gotten it out of the bundle that we were handed uh, right here. So that's it. Um, when you extract this, by the way, propositions and sort of proofs of propositions uh, extract to unit. So you're not carrying around your propositions in the OCaml code. They're only carried around to support the proofs you do in Coq. And that is my lecture for today. So please do the uh, homework in searchtree.v. And if you care to, you can look at the homework in uh, ADT. Dot v, 
And really, insert tree dot v. The only key things to look at are the proof of insert and look up. Um, yes. No, I'm, I'm done. Clock has an opaque module binding. Instead of using less than colon, you just use colon. But although it's true then that you can't build up anything, you can't sort of make use of that fact in a proof, number one. Number two, once you opaque bind, then when you try and compute with the operator in cock, it's sort of blocked by the opaque binding. Uh, so yes, cock has it, but it's not useful for that thing in that way. Yes. So oftentimes you prove something with extraction in mind, with extraction step afterwards. So what kind of general treatment approach you would use? Kind of placeholder in types for camel types uh, or try to prove it on normal in All right. Then? So the question is when you are writing Galena programs with the intent of extracting them to OCaml that will run fast. Um, what should you do, especially in, with respect to integer types and so on? Um, the first answer is do nothing special. So that was Xavier Loire's initial choice in CompCert, is he used Z, which at least has you know, decent log n performance, and he thought eventually he will have to use a better integer representation, but for now he just wanted to get the proofs to work. And then he discovered that this did not cause any performance problems at all in CompCert, and you can stop there. And then he said, in another project, the uh, Verasco uh, Symbolic Evaluator, this choice did cause problems, and he had to sort of do other things with representations. Um, so the answer varies, but you know, initially, I think the thing is keep it simple. Uh, don't use NAT, perhaps. Um, but you know, use something with adequate performance and worry about the extraction later. Uh, other questions? Yes. So it seems like the development here gave every tree meaning as a, a map. The search tree part felt like it fell a little lower. Ah, so because of the properties of my combined function, I didn't seem to need the search tree property. And that's almost true, except that the elements thing didn't work without the search tree property. So I did actually need the search tree property. And if I had added elements to my abstract data type in the ADT chapter, then I couldn't have used, I couldn't have gotten it to work even with unrealistically strong can relate. Other questions? Yes. Yep. And indeed, the conventional story about that would be that it will always include the representation of variance. And you sort of didn't need to have it at that particular moment. It looked like it's an organizational thing. But then at the end of the day, you include it as part of the module for the reasons you explained, right? So you, yep. you want the representation type needs to be the dependent product, which carries around actually the proof of the uh, representation of variance. And so then the abstraction relation certainly doesn't. All right, so let me, you didn't really have a question, but let me try and reformulate the answer anyway. I suspect that, suppose you had included the representation invariant in the abstraction relation so that it simply fails to relate anything that doesn't satisfy the representation invariant. Then when I did the cock module, I might still have needed a dependent product of a tree and a proof that there exists some M that the abstraction relation relates to this M. And that exists some M that, that's really the representation invariant. So I might not have saved myself anything. It might come out the same in the end. That, I'm not sure, but that's my suspicion. Other questions? Okay. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>